So thanks again for joining us today. I'm Michelle McLean with Salt Security, and I'm joined by Yaniv Balmas, our VP of Security Research, and Ilad Karen, our Chief Product Officer. And we're gonna kick off today's discussion with an overview from Yaniv about the vulnerability, how people exploit it, how it works, um, what, the, what the various uh, sequencing of actions is to take advantage of this vulnerability. And then we're gonna go over to Elad and just have a quick discussion on our experience. Uh, I'm sure you guys were all um, running around a little bit late last week, um, looking to see where you had this, this um, potential vulnerability in your own systems. So Elad's gonna talk a little bit about our, our uh, experience making sure that we were not vulnerable, but then also how the SALT algorithms picked up the exploits that began happening in our customer environments even before any news had hit or this was named or anything. But the most important thing is for, for us to get to your questions. So we're here for you and we'd love to, to get those questions answered. So we'll kick things off, Yaniv, with you, if you can start and walk us through a bit of an overview on the log four shell or log four J or log four. There's a lot of dispute about how one says it. Um, can you just walk us through a bit of an overview about the vulnerability? Yeah, sure. Hi, um, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, I just try to give you a brief technical overview. I truly hope that all of you already know the technical details, but just in case you are a bit dazzled from all the technical information out there. So that's my short uh, technical brief. It's really pretty simple and it's pretty short. Um, so let's take it step by step. Uh, first of all, Log4j. Um, Log4j is basically just an open source logging library for Java applications. So it's developed by Apache. And basically, it's the de facto, de facto standard for Java logging. So probably almost every Java application out there, if it uses logging, most probably it's using log4j for its logging. Uh, here you can see the, the GitHub page. Basically, we're talking about the latest version of log4j, which is version number two, so log4j2. Um, that's it about log4j. Now, um, basically, the way to use, if you're a software engineer or programmer, the way to use log4j is pretty straightforward. You can understand that even if you don't understand any line of code or any Java at all. Uh, what you need to do is very simple operations. One is to import the log4j library itself. Then you need to init this, uh, this new uh, class or this new library. And that's it, basically. You can start logging wherever you want in your code. You can just write logger info, logger hero, hero, logger debug, whatever. Write your log lines in there and everything will be logged. That's what the logging library is supposed to do. Um, now, the thing is that if you know anything about uh, logging libraries in general and log4j uh, specifically, you know that although they may seem pretty simple, under the hood, there are really pretty complex libraries. And that's because um, they are designed uh, to support many, many different logging cases. Um, specifically, the feature that we want to talk about that's related to the log 4 shell vulnerability um, is something called message lookup substitutions. Uh, now, maybe the name is a bit confusing, but the concept is pretty clear. Instead of uh, just writing text in your logs, you can now enter parameters that will be resolved to text later. Um, as you see in this example, uh, somebody wrote, hello world, and then enter the parameter uh, Java runtime. What will be displayed in the log line is a low world Java, Java version and the version itself. So this parameter will be converted to its actual value key value lookup, basically. Um, and now the vulnerability, uh, the log for shell vulnerability, is found in a one very specific plugin, which is called JNDI. Now, JNDI stands for Java Naming and Directory Interface. Basically, it allows key value search over a pre-configured directory service, rendering, a, returning a Java object. So, if you enter the line that you see below, JNDI, JNDI directory resource, what's supposed to happen, the, the, the expected behavior, is for the application to go to a predefined directory service, look up 
um, the value resource and bring it back to the library as a Java object. And then um, anything you want can be done with that um, in, in, from a logging perspective, of course. Um, and that's exactly where the problem lies. Um, so the thing is that the, the log4j implementation of this JNDI lookup uh, is a bit or was a bit problematic, and that's what what actually created the the vulnerability or the bug here. The thing is that instead of writing just the resource name to be fetched from this directory service, uh, if someone enters the entire URL, like you see below, JNDI LDAP domain.com. Um, the default pre-configured directory service will be completely bypassed, and what will happen is that the application will go to that new directory service and look up the object there, and it doesn't matter if this directory service is internal or external. Uh, now, this feature uh, supports uh, many things other than LDAP. It supports LDAP, LDAP Secure, DNS, RMI, uh, and stuff like that, but uh, the most commonly used option in the exploit is LDAP just because it's enabled by default in log4j, so most chances um, it will already be there and can be exploited. So just to sum things up to make, you, uh, to make sure you understand, the flow is this. Um, there is some service or application available uh, on the internet. Um, all the attacker has to do is to send some packet, de depends on what the application talking, if it's HTTP, if it's an API, you just, you, you just connect it uh, in the proper way. And then you need to send somewhere within this traffic, this JNDI LDAP string, right? What's expected to happen is that that string will find its way into some kind of logging line. And it doesn't matter if this line is in the, you know, internet-facing web server in some kind of back-end API server or in the database itself, wherever it will be logged, that will basically trigger the vulnerability. Now, the attacker, of course, enters uh, his own server, evilserver.com, and a resource that he controls. And what's going to happen here uh, is that whoever is logging this will actually connect to the attacker's server, download this Java object, and if you know anything about Java object, you understand that that's basically game over. Uh, so there could be code embedded into the constructor of this object, and that allows the attacker to do basically whatever he wants, practically run code on your machine, which is in the you know optimistic scenario, uh, will give him some limited code execution over the server, and in the worst case scenario, it's a complete network compromise. And now you have an attacker inside your network and you have no idea where he is. Now, one small nuance uh, that should be considered here is that, as you understand, if the attacker knows the service, so if it's an open source application or open source service, or you know he has the, he has the code on his computer, he can understand beforehand exactly where should this parameter be in order for it to get logged. But if it doesn't know the service, it's, if it's your own proprietary service, uh, then basically this forces the attacker to try and enumerate and send this string in many, many, many different places to many, many different endpoints until uh, you know he will, it will catch, until it will, it will hit uh, the log4j. And I think that that's a very important nuance. Uh, and I think Elad will have more to say about that later. But basically, that's it. That's everything you need to know. That's how Log4Shell works. It's incredibly easy to use this. Just basically anyone can use it. There's exploits code everywhere over the internet right now. Uh, and all you need is just you know a computer, internet connection, and keyboard, and that's it. You can basically now start exploiting, potentially exploiting networks, and I think that's like potentially a catastrophe uh, waiting to happen for everyone. And uh, hopefully you can stay secure or use us to stay secure. And that's it from my side. Thank you. Yeah, and when you were first uh, sharing some information in, about this with me, Yaniv, you were 
I mean, you've been doing security research for decades uh, and started hacking as a small child, <laughs> as I understand things. Um, and you basically intimated that you you felt like this was one of the worst vulnerabilities that you had seen in, in a long, long time. Yeah, that's right. I've, I've seen many vulnerabilities and exploits in my life, some public, some not public. And, and really, that one beats them all. And it's kind of, sometimes it can make me angry because, you know, other exploits, you take uh, days, months, uh, years to work on. And that one is just so simple, yet so uh, dangerous that it's really uh, unbelievable. All right. Well, thank you for that overview. I want to remind everybody um, that we're here for you and we're here to answer your questions. That's why we call it office hours. Uh, door is open. Ask me anything. And uh, with that, Ilad, we'll turn things over to you for a quick overview of the SALT experience, both internally, what we went through a little, and then what we saw in our customers' networks. Yes, yes, thanks, Michelle. And and before I do that, before I go ahead and uh, and take you through our process, I want to pause for questions. If you have any questions for Yaniv or uh, any or me or Michelle or anyone uh, before I proceed uh, with our agenda, <clears throat> if you do, you can type them in uh, in the uh, Q and A box, and uh, and we'll definitely take them. Uh, and I'll I'll even speak like. 20 more seconds to allow you the time to ask the question uh, and, I, and I'll stop. And, and as I take you through the process of when we heard it first and I, you know, found that um, that log, log for J or log for shell um, went out, um, we had a few cats and we just stormed into that. So assuming no questions, Michelle, keep me honest here. We don't have anything just yet or do Not we? quite yet. Not yet. Okay, perfect. So oh, you can you can dive in. Yeah, perfect. Keeping that to the end. So so that's nice. Um, so really keeping it short, but uh, just to take you through the process that we went through as as we discovered it, um, probably almost immediately uh, as as the word got out, our our system also started uh, shouting a few things, and I'll I'll touch that uh, very soon. But just for you all to know. Um, we went in basically three parallel paths. One, looking at our alerts and, and looking at all the things that our, our customers are going through, because we understood that this is a difficult time for everyone, given the, given the uh, um, uh, magnitude of and the simplicity of this potential attack, but also looking to understand, one, the components of our solution that sit with our customers, our collectors, our hybrid servers, are they vulnerable to this exploit and naturally our cloud uh, instances. So these two paths were explored uh, in parallel and, and, you know, very happy to say that our collectors are um, um, from the get go were great and, and, and no vulnerability there. We found that out very quickly. So we issued a um, kind of a um, calming message to our customers and to our uh, partners. And then also our hybrid server was uh, almost completely um, um, uh, clean and and safe. There was one matrix um, agent that was using a Datadog um, um, kind of service, and that was very quickly patched with the latest Datadog patch as a result of this one. So anywhere between 24 to 48 hours after the discovery of this, all our customers were uh, completely safe. And, and by the way, to begin with, um, the, the damage there was very, very limited or even non-existent as, um, uh, as this matrix agent is non-approachable or reachable. But, and this brings me to the last part, as Yaniv mentioned, the key thing to understand and, and looking at everything Yaniv explained so far, the attackers or potential attackers or um, those that were trying to go for this exploit had to go through a path or trial and error to find the right way to just send that that packet or that call so that this line would be logged in that uh, logging mechanism. And as you can imagine, it's not that simple. And we actually saw that. Um, a few things happened on our customer's front. One, we noticed that many customers that have a bug bounty program 
immediately started seeing a lot of requests that have the JNDY or um, um, kind of a similar um, you know, trial and error on many, many tasks, almost like scanning them, um, mainly because this was published and it was a race to the bounty. Uh, and, and we saw that in our system and it, it it was super interesting to see the trend of these requests coming in and our system surfacing that and bubbling that up um, along with the, the trend of lookup in Google of log for shell or log for J and JNDY. Uh, and that was really interesting. And, and, and the reason the system just floated it up is because this is not a known parameter. You, you wouldn't usually send a request that has any parameter or any query or anything that has the JNDY in it. You, you should, you don't really need to as you interact with, with the APIs. And as our system was baselining and understanding the structure of our customers' um, uh, APIs, then getting this request with JNDY or something similar that tries to find a way, the reconnaissance part of it, immediately triggered the alert because it shows path traversal potentially, it shows you know, an abnormal path in the site or in, in, in the API. And essentially what it, what it showed is that all of these steps resulted in the same, in the same manner. Somebody's trying to find their way in with the JNDY into the log4j logging and trying to check if the exploit is there or if the organization is vulnerable to it. Now, about two hours into the uh, into the uh, um, probably around Friday, uh, into the discovery and everything that uh, that went out, we immediately updated the system that even on the first attempt that we have the JNDY, we will trigger an immediate action taken or take action type of uh, um, uh, type of alert because we will also tell you that this is part of the CVE that was discovered. Um, that is a, usually that is what we do when we find significant discoveries like that, either by, by, by our, our researchers in, in Yaniv's team or any other publication. We will complement our existing system and, and models and, and behavioral models with additional knowledge and uh, inform, informative um, uh, or information that can help you understand better the types of attacks. So that is, in a nutshell, the way um, the way things rolled. And again, open for any questions. But um, um, you know, just before we we open it uh, for Q and A, and Michelle, um, I'll hand it over to you to ask the questions that we were uh, that we were sent. I'll I'll reiterate again. <clears throat> Salt Security has a system that automatically based on AI and machine learning will map the entire API, right? Learn the endpoints, learn the baselines of the parameters. No need to manually configure that. It automatically does that from the second we have traffic. This is why our platform is actually dealing with zero days in the best way possible. Because on zero day, you don't know what you're looking for. You're, you're looking for essentially an anomaly from the regular behavior, from the regular way of how users interact with the APIs. This is the real strength of the Salt Security Platform. Um, it, it's Log4j, it's any other zero day that will be introduced or already out there, but nobody still discovered yet. Um, yeah, and Michelle, this incident, I think, sparked, yeah, no, I think this incident sparked a lot of interesting conversations with our customers where this was a zero day that clearly the whole world was experiencing, but the reality is that when any of our customers finds themselves under attack, what that, what that bad actor is trying to do is, is identify some sort of gap in their business logic and, and exploit it. And so for our customers, at the end of the day, every API attack is essentially somebody who's zeroed in on a zero day, has found a zero day within the customer. And it's sort of how the platform's built is to identify those attempted exploits. Um, well, the good news is that your discussion spurred a few questions, Elad. So, um, so let's let's um, go through them. So, the first one is um, this person's asking: Is there a specific connection between this vulnerability and API calls? And if so, what is that connection? Yaniv, do you want, you want to jump in? 
Yeah, I can try and take that. So the, the thing is that the, specifically the vulnerability uh, is not directly related to API calls, right? It's whatever is using Java and what, whatever is using, using Log4j will theoretically be vulnerable um, to this Log4Shell vulnerability. Um, but in more realistic terms, um, if you have an internal service or some, some kind of internal application that's vulnerable, that's bad news, but it's not as bad news as if you have an ex externally uh, exposed uh, application or service. And the thing is that what's most commonly exposed today to the internet is APIs. Uh, and not only that it's exposed, but you can't really close them because many times this is your main business. Uh, so that's why I think Log4Shell uh, is realistically tied uh, to this vulnerability uh, a lot. And uh, it can be used over anything. But I think if, if, if you would ask me to choose an attack vector, um, I would definitely go for APIs uh, as my first shot. Um, so that's why I think it's it, it, it's super important to protect your APIs against that uh, vulnerability. And so that's basically why most of most of the the way that these these calls and these lookups would have been handled would have been through API calls for the most part. It's essentially what you're saying, that the, the transmission of that would have been through uh, yeah. API call. I think that would be one of the more uh, realistic, one of the more common um, attack surfaces uh, for attackers yeah. to try and, uh, and use. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 right. and just to add to that, if you, if you think about that, Michelle, just to, just to add a few more, no, no, one more point. Even if you have a client and you're interacting with some kind of a client, whether a mobile or a desktop, and you're using fields to input something, this will go through to the backend, most likely in today's technology, via an API, right? So even if not API directly, API will be involved there. So you know, just keep that in mind. Yeah, and and that because they were getting propagated through APIs, that's why we saw it so early in our customer environments because it didn't look Correct. it didn't look like the norm. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Um, all right. Um, Jason asks. Is there security tooling that we already have that could help us detect exploits of this vulnerability? I'm guessing people who do like scans and stuff will add these to the libraries very quickly, but do we, is there anything that people would already have in their toolkit that they could use? To, to, to find this vulnerability? To yeah. find if you, if you are vulnerable? To, uh, yes. to something. So there are uh, several, uh, yeah. So there are several tools out there that's uh, publicly available for everyone to download. You can Google them. I think there, are, I counted around a dozen uh, different uh, vulnerability scanners that are free. Others may be paid, uh, but definitely, you know, the entire world is. I think that's the biggest problem of the you know cyber ecosystem at the moment. Everybody is trying to find out if they are vulnerable and where they are vulnerable. Uh, and yes, definitely there are many tools. And I think if you ask the same question 24 hours from now, from now, probably there will be double the number of the, of the tools that are available now. Okay, great. Uh, and we will have time for a few more questions. We've had, um, we've had another one um, come in. Yaniv, I think we'll direct this to you. I've heard that there's a second CVE associated with Log4Shell. Can you talk a little bit about that second vulnerability? Yeah, that, that's right. There, there has been use of a second Log4Shell vulnerability. Um, basically, I think it's kind of an overstatement to call it a second Log4Shell vulnerability. Uh, what it is is kind of, a, as I said before, I think it's kind of a spin-off on the first one. So basically, uh, someone found out that the patch uh, that Apache provided for the original vulnerability wasn't uh, sufficient in all cases. So in some rare edge cases, uh, there could be some conditions that may lead to a denial of service condition. So notice that that's a very important nuance. So there is no more remote code execution. Nobody can uh, actually... Uh, break into your networks, the worst he, he can do, which sometimes is very bad, but uh, 
uh, he, he can just you know drop your services make your services unavailable temporarily uh, so I, I'm not I'm not trying to say it's not uh, severe or anything it might be but I think if you uh, look at it from the 50,000 uh, miles view then uh, the first vulnerability is uh, by magnitude more severe than this one and uh, by the way there's already uh, a patch available for this second vulnerability as well so uh, if you're thinking about updating uh, you better go and update to the latest version and not to the one uh, before okay that's great advice all right we're happy to entertain any additional questions. It's what we've had so far. But we'll stay on the line for another minute or so. We have a quiet, quiet crew, just a handful of questions today. All right, well, this is not the last of our office hours. We'll have more on additional, um, additional topics. In fact, we would love to hear from you if you have uh, topics that you'd like for us to cover. Um, on office hours, anything to do with you know the use of APIs, security of APIs, operationalizing use of, of APIs, um, we'd, we'd love to get your thoughts on additional topics that we could cover. So I really wanna thank everybody. Thank you for those in the audience who sent forward some questions. We really appreciate that. And many, many thanks to Yaniv and Ilad for sharing your expertise on this vulnerability and to Tiffany behind the scenes for pulling this together in about 36 hours. We really appreciate it. We would love to hear from you. Uh, you can write to us at info at salt.security if you wanna share some feedback or share any ideas for future topics. We will make this session available on demand in about a day, and we'll send that link over to you in case you want to share the recording with any colleagues. And with that, I wanna thank everybody for tuning in today and wish everybody a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.